Hello and welcome to Spotlights. This is the podcast for the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. I'm your host, Sam Mickey. And this week on the show, I'm happy to welcome back Kim Carfor. Kim, welcome back. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's my pleasure. And, you know, I say welcome back because you were on the show, what, a couple months ago, around the time that the American Academy of Religion uh, annual meeting was happening. And you gave us a, a rundown of pretty much all the religion ecology stuff that was happening at the conference. And uh, but we didn't get to talk about your actual work, your own work. So I wanted to have you back at some point. Uh, especially um, some teaching that you do for the environmental studies program at the University of San Francisco. And, you know, you teach a variety of classes, but the stuff I really wanted to talk about uh, is a class that's like an outdoor education class. I think it's nature immersion. Um, and you never really know what that means. To some extent, a nature immersion class sounds like just like a blow off class where people just go hiking. <laughs> Kind of. Yeah, absolutely. Some um, of them take it that way. And it's kind of just this like add nature and stir kind of thing. You just do normal education, but you're maybe sitting around a campfire somewhere doing it. So uh, I wonder, you know, what's your approach? Because I know a little about it and I know that it gets uh, it gets deeper than that. Yeah, super. Uh, thanks. So for me, uh, nature immersion is, first of all, noticing that we're always already immersed in nature, right? I think um, nature immersion tends to be this class where, you know, oh, let's go out and do this ecotourism, right? I'm around San Francisco, so there's lots of beautiful areas. Um, it's easy to take it that way, but um, I like to go a little bit deeper with my class. Um, I teach them nature awareness skills, which, you know, open up into uh, levels of spirituality or deep ecology. Um, I also teach them, uh, I do some reskilling as well. And so teach them fire making and cordage. Um, and so these very tangible lessons, right? I often lead the class with um, saying, you know, we're university teaches us like we're heads on sticks, but going out into nature, we become uh, more embodied. We tap into our primal nature, our animal selves. Um, very simple things like, uh, making yourself comfortable when, you know, we're in the middle of a, a windstorm or it's raining and um, just feeling a little bit, trying to learn in those moments, taking outdoors, um, taking all the teachable moments that the outdoors opens up because you never know what you're going to encounter. Um, I know that one time we encountered, you know, five coyotes one day and then another time we were out learning how to orient ourselves and I, I taught them map and compass skills and we were trying to figure out how to get to a water source um, and we found like a dead cow skeleton on the way and it's you know it's cool things that I can't prep those lessons um, and it's so it really opens up the sense of awe and wonder in students because um, you know nature is the classroom and you know when we're indoors there's a lot of great things that um, indoor learning um, opportunities that that offers but the classroom is very um, kind of like a lab in that sense. So yeah, just opening up into these summer, some deeper lessons, um, opening up to their ecological selves, reskilling, things like that. Right, I appreciate the, uh, the reskilling. I think otherwise, you know, I know there's some big conferences that people can go to like workshop kind of stuff to do some reskilling, but it's not like in the university. Uh, and so, you know, the university is really missing out on things that people clearly are interested in. Um, and so, I don't know, I'd like to see more uh, kind of eco-literacy written into more core curriculum in general, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess there's a lot of studies, too, that indicate that these kinds of uh, skills and practices are also really beneficial for mental health, uh, right? That, you know, outdoor experience is good for you and yeah. <laughs> being stuck indoors is bad. And I think yeah. we've all um, especially felt that, you know, during the pandemic for the last year, you know, people talk about a mental health crisis running parallel to the pandemic. And part of that is just the anxiety of being very cloistered away and not being able to connect with each other. And mm -hmm. one of the ways yeah. to, to deal with that then is to facilitate more nature awareness. Right, because not only are you getting to know, in my classroom I teach how to get to know your non-human neighbors, and so in a sense you realize you're less isolated, um, because oftentimes we think of neighbors as our human neighbors, and our family is just our family member, um, you know, human family. 
So kind of opening up into that, but also you mentioned this idea of research and mental health. Um, being indoors, we're not exposed to things. Like my favorite lesson is um, there's this um, bacterium called Mycobacterium vaxi that when you go outdoors and you inhale this um, bacterium, or if it gets uh, through the pores of your skin, it actually releases serotonin. And so it's not just that, you know, being outdoors, you might experience a sense of awe and wonder. It's there's an actual, you know, biochemical, um, uh, at the biochemical level, this sort of um, connection between mental health and the outdoors is happening as well. That sort of exchange, right? I like that a lot. It explains why people who are really into gardening seem so happy about it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're kind actually of, getting something from having their hands in that soil. Yeah, that's kind of what got me into the work when I was really young. Um, I mean, I felt very happy and connected outdoors, but then I remember when I got old enough to start going on hikes, I just noticed everyone was so nice. When you walked by them, they all hi. It was like, why is everyone so nice outdoors? <laughs> It's true, as opposed to walking past people in, like, the city. in a dense urban environment and yeah. people aren't super excited to see each Not, other. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, well, so here's a really big question uh, that I think we're all struggling with is teaching online, right? For this last uh, year, a lot of people have had to move online and that means that we don't you know, get to interact with each other, but some classes really suffer from that more than others what has happened to a nature immersion class? Have you been able to offer that online like at all really? Yeah, that's super funny. It's a funny question um, because, you know, when I was in grad school, we were learning all these things like how to think about nature um, as not just the great outdoors, right? And so I was kind of trying to create certain practices um, alongside theorizing this um, type of, of, of nature. And so it was interesting when the pandemic hit um, and, you know, I'd been teaching nature immersion, which is basically just go outdoors and, you know, do all these lessons outside, all the whole classroom was outside. And then, um, you know, USF was like, okay, everything's online. And, you know, nature immersion professors, I think there were like four classes that were supposed to run and a bunch of professors dropped. And I was like, oh, I can, I'm happy to creatively try to figure out how to um, uh, create online lessons so that this class still still goes on. So um, yeah, it, it was it was very much like a, a work of translation, um, kind of figuring out how to um, develop these lessons. Like a lot of the times, you know, outdoors, I would have the students do, you know, a meditation by the ocean. Um, tapping into your ecological selves. And so just because I wasn't right there alongside of them, um, I, I figured, oh, I'll just record it on audio and then upload it to Canvas and then, you know, tell them just to listen to that on their phones while they're outside. And um, yeah, so that was one example of how I developed the, the, the paradox of how to do outdoor education in a remote environment during the pandemic. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, because it just seems inherently paradoxical yeah it you is can't do, <laughs> like environmental education on zoom yeah seems, you absolutely. know it seems like something uh is lacking well so that's good I, so you just kind of like you lose the the group uh right. being outdoors together but you can still get the group together for discussion but then you just have individuals go out and do the same practices exactly like on the because the course meets you know for a couple hours on the weekend and so that's our time to connect as a community and then i'll teach them I'll give them a little bit of a lecture to kind of give them the theory and then I'll develop a practice and teach them the practice and then have them go do it on their own. And then they'll do like a journal assignment or maybe like draw a picture of a plant or a bird that you encountered, um, label it, identify it, and then kind of upload it and then do that again the next weekend, right? Come back as a community, talk about what we experienced. So kind of just getting at these multiple levels. And in a sense, it has been better than just teaching outdoors because I think when you're outdoors you know I don't have a PowerPoint where I can teach them why this is important and the certain theorists that you know uh, talk about this at the theoretical level uh, so in a sense it, it, it deepens some of the lessons uh, rather than just going outdoors and meditating by the ocean or something like that right right so you can, you can prep them more yeah um, exactly and I could, I get where like a meditation by the ocean, you know, especially if it's guided meditation or something where you're leading them through some steps of things to think about or to feel into 
Like that seems like that translates just fine. Uh, some right. stuff doesn't seem like it would, I mean, like you can't, you know, go hiking together. You could go on a hike by yourself, like some of that stuff. Sure. But some like reskilling stuff, especially seems like you kind of need to be there. Uh, mm -hmm. what's one of the, uh, I guess more counterintuitive practices that you have been able to move online? Well, yeah, the, the reskilling, um, one of the practices has been the fire making, um, which I happen to have, uh, right over here if you want to take a look at it so um this is my flint and steel fire oh, set so this right. is flint and then this is steel and so what i do is i will upload a, I'll, I'll make a video to show students how and then i offer them um you, you know you can purchase this at this website or you know you can also instead of flint you can use quartz and then steel you can find like a an old screwdriver in your house. And so I have them also look for like household items um, that they can use to make fire. Um, one is like you can take lint from your, your dryer and that can be a Tinder, your Tinder bundle. Uh, when we're doing outdoor education, a Tinder bundle usually comes from the bark of a tree. And so in a sense, it's, it's, it's translating some of these nature, you know, reskilling wilderness skills to a more like Anthropocene, right? Because, you know, who says you can't use the lint from your dryer as a Tinder bundle? Um, but so yeah. Do you, make the, do you make fire on Zoom? I mean, I do. <laughs> um, With the flint and steel? I do, yeah. I, I have to, um, the Tinder bundle is a separate part, but yeah, I can, I can show you if you'd like. So you just, um, Kind of like a an there's an art to it and you have to hit the steel um at like a, a 90 degree angle on a, a rough edge of your flint and so i'm gonna did you see the sparks i'm gonna try it again okay well i got it on the first try so <laughs> oh hey yeah bragging a little bit that's good for people who are one? just listening uh, i think they at least heard the, the hit yeah no that's pretty good i uh would have thought that maybe that's a little dangerous um, to, uh, to use flint and steel at your computer. <laughs> Me, and that's the funny thing is if I'm doing this outdoors and, you know, it's wildfire season and there's tons of dead, dry grass, then it is dangerous because a spark could fall on the grass. But honestly, um, it's funny because when I'm teaching flint and steel fire, it takes a long time before, um, you can get, you're supposed to like get a piece of the spark into the tinder bundle. And so without the tinder bundle, there's nothing for the, the spark right. to erupt. Like you really need some fine fibers and like the computer, there's no fine fibers around here. I like see. it's not, it's not even gonna catch on my hair. It's, <laughs> that's why I call it an art form, right? Because there's a very specific, um, it's almost like you have to cradle the spark and yeah, and I've uh, into a fire. I've had a flint and steel thing before and didn't understand how that was supposed to work. <laughs> so yeah, there's clearly <laughs> yeah. there's clearly an art to it. And so then you have students like doing this stuff, but they're you know like at home because right it's all like online school. school. So like the dorms are shut down. Students are just living like with their parents or maybe you know with uh, other roommates or something. So that must like like are you basically saying, hey, go set fire somewhere in your home. And then... Yeah, so I do have to tell everybody it's not a mandatory lesson um, because it's safety first. And so, uh, you know, I tell them all the basics that I would tell them in person that if you want to start a fire, you need um, to have like a, either a fire pit, a fireplace, or if you have access to the outdoors, dig a hole. Um, make sure you have water next to you. But yeah, I do, because I really care about one of the main reasons that I've created these sort of um, nature awareness exercises um, is because I care very much about inclusivity. And so the outdoors has been traditionally, you know, very uh, white male dominated and to, to bringing it back to, you know, your everyday experience, I care very much about, you know, so I, I lead this class being, you know, to do nature immersion remotely, 
you can, you know, as long as you have like access to a window, then you can take this class. And so this is a long way of saying that um, there are many household items that people can use to make fire. And so I actually had a student who was, um, you know, had this little ball of lint and then she was using like a plastic bag with the, the light to go through to make the fire and her mom walks in and she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> she's like, oh, okay, sorry. And I had to put it away. <laughs> like, no, this, yeah, is a, this is a college class. This is a very serious college level class. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I, mean, I appreciate the access point that you're making that it actually if um, you know, there are justice issues tied into the fact that wilderness areas, you know, privilege certain economic classes or able bodied people. And so there's ways to actually tap into uh, your connection to Earth, to the universe, uh, just, mm -hmm. you know, wherever you're at. Right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's a interesting, like unintended benefit uh, that's come mm -hmm. out of kind of moving online. Absolutely. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, I wonder, you know, is there a practice that you do that you could share with us, you know, kind of like for anybody who teaches any kind of environmental thing, a lot of us love including experiential exercises in our classes. Um, fire making might not be one a lot of us can do. <laughs> I know me personally, that's not <laughs> happening. So I'm happy is to there... come to your classes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's good to know. <laughs> um, but for something, you know, for just average kind of person who wants to include uh, a practice, what's a, what's a pretty easy one to get into? Um, well, there's a couple I really like, um, there's this one that I like to do called Shinrin Yoku. And, um, I think technically that means forest bathing. Um, but the person I adopted it, this practice from is just means, um, engaging nature in all of your senses. And so, you know, it'll be a meditation where you just open your eyes, you know, sight, you'll look around and absorb nature just using your sight and then sound. So then you'll focus in on the sound, smell, um, touch, and then taste. So like, you know, you can put soil in your mouth or something like that. So that's like a meditation that I like to use. Another meditation I like to use is called going feral. And so it's about tapping into your ecological self, um, trying to shut down the egoic my, the the rational mind the ego tapping into one's emotions and intuitions and using that as a way into tapping into the natural world communication that's going on in the natural world all the time um, so that's why meditation really is a good tool for nature awareness is because it's um opening up to your multiple ways of knowing um, so those are some of the meditation some of the actual practical practices that i like to use um, is the sit spot. I know a lot of people who teach outdoor education um, adopt a, a sit spot. And so basically a sit spot can be anywhere, you know, out your front porch, your backyard, your local park. Um, but the main goal of having a sit spot is to get to know your non-human neighbors and the regularity is really important. And so it's a place that you go back to all the time um, because you wanna see you want to get to know, you know, the, the native plant species. You want to start to differentiate between um, local bird species and migratory bird species. And so that's why you have to go to the same place over and over again. So I have them, you know, do a bird identification practices to start learning these species. Um, and so I have them use apps. Um, there's a bird app where you can learn to identify birds based upon uh, what they look like and their sound. And then I also use an app called iNaturalist where um, you uh, can take a picture of a plant and then uh, identify that plant and then learn about, you know, uh, that, that, that plant species. And then um, another one of my absolute favorites is um, bird language. And so I have adopted this from John Young. And he, um, I mean, I could go into it or <laughs> I'm not sure if we have time, but uh, well, I mean, I'd be curious a little bit uh, what the I mean, short because I get the identifying the bird species. What would it mean to like identify the bird's language, like learning like what its chirps mean? And right, yeah. So, so the main thing of bird language is identifying their five basic um, types of speech, mm -hmm. and so you know, one example is an alarm. 
And so, you know, one is song where you can, you can identify song. That one's pretty easy. Um, but then the alarm is actually when they're just really high pitched staccato noises like doot, doot, doot. Um, and so you'll just learn um, that that's how they communicate to one another um, that when they're speaking an alarm that maybe there's like a an occipiter or you know a cat around and they're warning their other friends um, that there's uh, danger around. There's also something called a shapes of alarm. And so this is a cool um, way to think about non-human communication in general, right? Because humans often think of communication as vocal. Um, but when you're learning about communication, also known as like biosemiotics, um, when you're learning about communication in the natural world, oftentimes it's, it's opening up to patterns and pattern identification and instead of just listening. So a shape of alarm is, so say a bird is, you know, there's a predator around, say there's like a cougar. And then if you are looking in the trees and you see many birds that will do this popcorn, you go from like this level to this level, um, you can identify that there is a predator that is probably on the ground um, because the, you know, the law of the wild is that it takes calories um, to, to use calories. And so when you want to use as few calories as possible. Um, and so the reason that they pop corn into the middle is because that's just far away um, from where the cat can jump up and get them. Um, and so, but if it's like a, a bird, like an occipiter, an occipiter is like a hawk or an owl, um, then it might, you'll see the birds just like kind of scattershot that way. So then that's, if you see the birds scattershot that way, you might think, oh, even though I don't see an owl, I can tell that there's probably an owl around because they're behaving in a certain way. So kind of mm. opening up to these different shapes. Interesting. So yeah, you'd know, oh, that couldn't be a cat or something attacking from the ground. That's not because they wouldn't waste the energy. They wouldn't waste the energy. Yeah, exactly. that's very interesting. I like the idea of uh, seeing language yeah. too. Because I guess, I mean, I think everybody gets this with like a cat or a dog. You can tell so much by the way they're wagging their tail. Yeah. Right? Because you, you see Happy, the communication. agitated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that's a good one. And more something I could I could see uh, doing aside, you know, because fire making sounds complicated. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, you mentioned uh, who you're getting some of the ideas of bird language from. Who was this again? Yeah. So um, John Young uh, has a book called What the Robin Knows. And so he covers all of this. That's a great resource if you're interested in, in learning about bird language. He also has a website with a bunch of, um, you know, bird sounds if you want to really dive into learning bird language he's got a whole wealth of resource so yeah oh nice he's the guy to go to he's the bird language guy yeah and yeah. he adopted his practices from a lineage um starting with an, an apache elder stalking wolf so hmm. okay interesting um well geez i really appreciate this you know we had uh, jason brown on uh, on the podcast uh about a week ago and uh, he was talking about similar kinds of things. He's, you know, doing like assignments where students would journal about the oh, yeah. trees that are around. And so it's like you don't have to go to, you know, a national park. There's yeah. going to be trees just around your house or even just the trees that are in the things that we use, like wood in your house. And, you know, so I appreciate all these ways that people are finding to uh, bring nature into our lives, even when we're teaching online. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. I, I like hearing that he did that um, because I had a exercise last semester, which I'll probably also do this semester. Um, it's just basically commune with a tree. And so step by step, just tell them how to, and it's basically tap into your intuition, try to get out of your mind, quiet the mind. Um, and I had a student who, uh, and she described to me how just even finding the tree was a very intuitive experience for her. You know, which is the tree that's talking to me, which tree wants me to sit down next to it, you know, rather than just me thinking um, in that sort of dominator um, attitude, right? Which one do I want to? Um, and so, yeah, it was a very emotional experience for her, she, she described. Mm, that's a good one. Yeah, I think 
trees and birds are things that are easy to to forget are right around us yeah it's absolutely kind of like once you you know open your mind to that possibility then these the things start to call out to us a little bit more absolutely and that's kind of like what a lot of my work is surrounded um tuning into the voice of the wild right um it's 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 always there you know it's just learning to tap into it That's really great. Um, I guess if you could give us one, you know, one final thing, what is another resource for people who want to get into this stuff? What else uh, are, are you doing? Any other things, you know, uh, where can we, where can we learn more? Well, I have just um, started a business called Ikazoa, um, where I was, I'm offering these lessons um, privately because, you know, it's great. I have my nature immersion class. I'm very blessed to have that at the University of San Francisco and then um, offering some of those practices that I have developed and honed um, on Ikazoa, right? Ikazoa just means um, uh, ecology of life. And um, so just, kind of tapping into these multiple ways of knowing. Um, so that's one example. Nice. No, that's great. I'll make sure to, uh, to add a link in the uh, episode information. Uh, and That's super. I guess if, uh, if anybody wants you to come into their, uh, to their class and do some fire making stuff for them, that's one of the nice things about, you know, zoom teaching is you can get guest speakers from like anywhere in the world. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's very uh, true. so, um, so yeah, if anybody, uh, you know, wants your fire making services, we'll make sure to, Uh, give them your contact info and stuff. So who knows, you might be doing a lot of fire making now that Oh, you've uh, put yourself out there like that. I, yeah, great. No, I appreciate it. I absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things to do. It's one of my favorite skills. And it's one of those very, just like all the things I've um, discussed today, all of these are practices, right? Gary Snyder talks about the practice of the wild. And so the more that I get the opportunity to do it, the more that that, um, that skill and, and stays alive, right? It's, you know, I, I think often of, um, you know, our indigenous, indigenous people, indigenous elders, indigenous knowledge um, that keep it, it's, it's up to people to keep those alive. And so, you know, really making those connections and breathing life into those, those practices is, is so important. So. Yeah, right. It reminds me of um, a quote from Rachel Carson. What is it? Uh, I actually have it right here. Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. Um, That's beautiful. and so I know I've experienced that in my own way. And, uh, you know, when things are very difficult and times are tough, that tapping into that, you know, practice of the wild and finding that energy is just this inexhaustible uh, reserve of uh, strength and courage and power. And, uh, so I really appreciate you sharing some of that with us today. Uh, Kim Carfor, thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It was really, really a blessing. Yeah, always a pleasure. And, uh, and thanks to everybody for uh, tuning in. We'll be back again next week with another episode. And in the meantime, take care. and be well.